I'm not sure how many of you have been looking for Easter ideas this year, but I, I read about a few of them on social media that kind of stood out to me. You can find so many things there. And I found some photos of these oversized Easter baskets, and they actually were constructed with a, a giant kiddie pool, and then they would use hula hoops or pool noodles to form the handle for this basket. And then those baskets, they were piled high just with mountains of candy and stuffed animals and sporting equipment and toys that parents had come up with. Gone are the days of my youth. I remember when I was a kid, our Easter baskets, we had a few eggs filled with jelly beans and maybe a chocolate bunny. And that was about it. That was everything. And today, people have gone to greater and greater extents just to eclipse that. Uh, There are some parents who have even tried to turn it into Christmas 2.0, a second round of Christmas, filling baskets with video games and high-end electronics. In fact, I remember this kind of caught me off guard. There was one woman who had an eight-month-old daughter, and she decided to give that eight-month-old daughter an iPhone and an iPad in her Easter basket, and she was asking on an online forum for advice about different apps that she could download Uh, that would be age appropriate for her daughter. I thought, man, I I would never ever be able to do something like that for an eight-month-old. Not only that, uh, one parent filed a complaint on a major retailer's website. And the complaint, it said this, thanks for ruining our kid's Easter by failing to deliver the swing set in time. I thought, man, the swing set. I never received a swing set for an Easter gift. I never received a swing set for a Christmas present. That's a big gift. Um, But things have gone to such an extreme. In fact, the average uh, Easter spending is $151 per person. Our country spends $18 billion on Easter annually now. And it seems like things in these changing times are becoming ever more excessive. And I have to be careful. I almost have a tendency to be judgmental toward things like that. And maybe as followers of Christ, we view excess as a bad thing, especially because in our age of materialism, uh, that materialism focus tends to overshadow so many things uh, that relate to the spiritual meaning, the significance behind the holidays in the first place. But in today's passage, we're actually going to discover that a healthy dose of Easter extravagance might be just the thing that we need. So we're going to open God's word to John chapter 12 today and take a look at the life of Mary. And Mary, she does something very extravagant, something that, again, we from our perspective, we might even look down on and say, how could you do that? That was a waste. But we see that that act of extravagance is actually an act of great worship this morning. It starts this way in John 12, 1. It says, then six days before the Passover... I'm not sure how many of you this morning are familiar with the Jewish holiday of the Passover and where the origins of that came from. But it really relates and it ties things into our Easter. And so long ago when Israel was uh, enslaved in Egypt for a period of uh, a couple hundred years at least under a Pharaoh there, uh, this is around 1440 BC, God called Moses, who became a great leader in Israel, to go and deliver the people from that Pharaoh and from that slavery. And there was a series of plagues that God sent, these supernatural events to convince Pharaoh and the Egyptian people that they needed to let his people go. And the last plague that was introduced was death. It was death of the firstborn. And so that night, a death angel came through the camp. And the firstborn child in these different homes, uh, as the angel went by, died as a consequence. But God had provided a way for Israel and anyone else in Egypt who chose to follow his um, prescription Um, a way for them to be delivered. And that way was to take a lamb, a specific type of lamb, a young lamb, a, a, a lamb without blemish, to slaughter the lamb and place the lamb's blood around the doorpost of the home. And then when the death angel saw that blood, it would move by and and that child would be spared in that home. And there's a reason why Jesus was sacrificed at Passover for our sins. He is supposed to take us back to that moment. And and unlike the Israelites, we are not saved from a physical death uh, at night when a death angel passes by. But we're saved from a spiritual death, a separation from God forever. And that, that comes through faith in Christ, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came down. He lived a perfect life and he took all of our sins. The weight of the world, as we talked about last week, it was placed on his shoulders. And he hung on the cross with our sins on him. And he was punished for us in our place. So that we by faith could turn toward him and look to his sacrifice. And apply that to our own lives by faith. 
and again receive forgiveness of sin, a renewed relationship with God, an eternity with him forever. And Jesus Christ became our way, our way to be reconciled back to God, the relationship that was broken by sin. And so really that is the heart of of Easter. That is the heart of why the resurrection happened. The resurrection put really uh, God's stamp of approval, God's guarantee on that. Because there's a lot of leaders who have made great claims over the years, but no one else has managed to rise from the dead and stay alive forevermore. And yet Christ did that to prove that he is the way. He is the sacrifice for us. And that, again, that's the true meaning of Easter. But we're going to take a little bit of a different approach this morning as we look into the rest of John chapter 12. It says in the next phrase in John chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus came to Bethany. This is a small town about one and three-quarter miles to the southeast of Jerusalem. And so just over the edge of the hill of the Mount of Olives, just out of sight of the old city of Israel, of, of Jerusalem, if some of you have been to Israel in the past, and so just over the hill, so to speak, from Gethsemane and the Mount of Olives and all those things. It says, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he, Jesus, had raised from the dead, and the idea is he lived there. And that's another story. In fact, uh, David quoted a verse up on the screen from that this morning where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he tells that to, to Martha, one of the sisters of, of Lazarus, just before Jesus walks into a cave where he's been buried four days before Lazarus has been. He's died. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And this man wrapped in strips of linen and grave claws, like a modern day kind of mummy concept, comes walking out of the tomb. And everyone is amazed. And this same Lazarus comes into the story today. And this is after his resurrection. And so there's a dinner party. And he's kind of one of the key figures because you can imagine that would create quite a stir if a guy died four days ago and then all of a sudden came back to life. A lot of people would come to the party if he's coming to dinner. You know, Jesus is there, but also this guy who used to be dead. So think of the table conversation that you could have with somebody like that, you know. You were dead for four days. What was that like? And so he is at this house as well. But the, the focus is going to be shifted not toward Lazarus, but toward Christ. Again, because of an act of worship that, that Mary specifically does in this feast. But at first, we're going to look at some different means of worship. How can you worship God? There's a lot of different ways to worship. We think of worship as singing songs or praises, but that's only one small component of what God views as worship. Uh, there's a lot of things. I remember my first experience as a child at Walt Disney World or anything Disney affiliated. I was eight years old, and my parents had been saving up for quite a while to take us on this family vacation to Walt Disney World. I grew up in the Midwest, and so a little ways away from here, and Disney World was the closer destination, not Disneyland, so that's where we went. But when I showed up as an eight-year-old, I remember just being blown away at all the ways that existed for getting from point A to point B at Walt Disney World. We could drive there in the vehicle that we took down. We could walk anywhere we wanted, although it was a long walk to most places, especially as an eight-year-old. They had Disney buses that drove you to different parks and different parts of the theme park areas. And they had this thing called a monorail, which seemed very futuristic at the time. You get on this train, and it takes you through all the hotels. And my dad had actually really kind of ponied up, and we stayed at a hotel that the monorail passed through. So this is a big sacrifice for him because we didn't have a lot of money at that point in time. Uh, still don't have a lot of money, but, but that was a neat experience. We boarded the monorail in the middle of our hotel and took it out to the front gates. There was a riverboat that we took to different places in the park. There was a train that went over the entire perimeter, and so we could stop in different lands. Some people even managed, I don't know how, to get rides in these old cars or, or horse-drawn wagons. But there are so many options. But all those options got you to the same place. And really, worship operates very similarly. There's so many ways to worship God, and they can all get us to the same place, a place where our life in that moment is being honoring to God and putting the focus on him through whatever specific way of worship that we're doing. And we see different people worshiping in different ways as we get into the story. Again, the focus is on Mary, but she's not the only one who is showing worship to Christ in different ways. It says in verse 2, there at the house of Simon the leper, it's in brackets because we get that from the Matthew and the Mark account. So he's the, the host. Presumably he used to be a leper. Uh, have a contagious skin disease, and they wouldn't associate with those people. They'd keep them on the, the uh, exteriors of the towns, kind of in the countryside. They'd have to shout unclean before they came near anyone. Um, but apparently after Jesus healed him, you know, this was one of the ways that he could show gratitude. So he supplies his home for this dinner. Maybe he has a, a bigger home, and it seems to indicate that, because this is probably, again, drawing quite a crowd, especially with Lazarus and Jesus being there in the same place. 
And so that's the way that he worships. And maybe that's the way that you worship God. You have something that you can give. Maybe it's a home that you can open up for hospitality or some resource that you can supply. And then there's the next figure that we encounter in the story, and that's Martha. Martha is Lazarus' sister, one of his sisters, and it says she served. She's the one that serves the guest. And the Greek word behind that, it, it, it encompasses preparing the food and also waiting on tables. And so she's in the kitchen mixing everything and baking everything and preparing everything. And then she comes out to, to set the plates, you know, and refill the glasses and things of that nature because she is a servant. And some of you guys in our church family, you are servants. And maybe if you're visiting with us, that's your bent. Maybe that's the way God's gifted you. And so you love to show hospitality and you love to serve people in different hands-on ways. Then there's Lazarus. It says, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And this was kind of an honor, again, because he gets to, to relax. He's not doing the work, but he's enjoying the meal. But part of that is conversation, especially in Eastern culture. Um, meals are not these quick, you know, fast food type experiences. It's a, you enjoy your time seated there. You enjoy the conversation. And uh, I can't help but think his conversation probably is going back and forth with not only Jesus' disciples and maybe other guests, but also with Jesus himself. And so um, his presence, uh, just being in Jesus' presence, is an act of worship. And sometimes we have an opportunity to spend time with Jesus. And that time that we devote to him, whether we're praying, whether we're letting him speak to us through his word or things of that nature, and maybe just sitting in silence for a while and, and seeing what he impresses on our heart with the Holy Spirit. All those things are acts of worship. And then we come to Mary in verse 3, and that's the fourth and final example that we see here. And Mary's is different, okay? It's out on a limb. And maybe sometimes we see people worship God in certain ways, and we think, is that even viable? <laughs> it, does that qualify? And this is one of those things. It says, then Mary took an alabaster flask containing a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. She broke the flask and poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Then she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. And so she sacrifices this fragrant oil and she pours it on Jesus' head. And that's her act of worship. And I want to bring you into the experience a little bit. And so I went online and I actually have a bottle of pure spikenard oil. And as you'll see from this story, this is not cheap stuff. Uh, if you were to buy the same quantity that Mary bought, and we'll talk about that more in a moment, it would cost you five grand. And so this bottle alone is $66. It's five milliliters. But it's unlike anything that you've ever smelled before. And it's probably unlike what you would have imagined this oil that anointed Christ to smell like. And so I want to, again, bring you into that. So I'm going to pass it around the room. And if you want to retain it for a while, just take a drop of it and wipe it across your forearm, okay? One or both of them, and then you'll, you'll really get the experience for the remainder of our, our message today. If you just want to sample it with your nose, because again, it's different than what you're going to picture. Um, but this is it. This is what hit the room with full force that night. It's the stuff, okay? So I'm going to send it around. You can experience that, or you can just uh, waft it and sniff it a little bit and then pass it along to the next person. It's supposed to be calming, so if people fall asleep this morning, then we'll know why. But again, she poured out 96 times more oil than is contained in this bottle on the head and on the feet of Jesus. It was also in a room that was probably no more than one-sixth the size of this room. And so if you think that this smells kind of potent, you can't even imagine the smell of this and the fragrance throughout that home. And so I think at this point, um, there's a couple of questions for us to entertain. One of those is, how am I currently worshiping Jesus? Because all of these people, they were involved in their own specific way in giving worship to Jesus. But I think there's another thing that's really worthy of our consideration at this point. And that's something that Mark's gospel, in that account, it brings this out. And there's a phrase that Jesus says toward the end of this account in reference to Mary pouring this oil on his head and wiping it on his feet uh, with her hair. And Jesus says, she has done what she could. She's done what she could. And I think that's a great question for us to ask as well. What could I do for Jesus? What could you do for Jesus? What am I capable of? What are you capable of? And what I find is that I'm often capable of doing a lot more things than I'm comfortable with, right? There's a difference there. 
And even here at the church lately, especially with COVID, I've discovered there's a lot of things that I can do, but I'm not necessarily comfortable with them. I'm not good with construction projects, and yet we're trying to tear out a wall between two classrooms and put in doors and, you know, take out siding. And there's other people in this church body who are much more uh, skilled than I am. But that's something that's out of my comfort zone, and I have to be involved to a degree. Um, Not take it on, but to a degree. We've done a lot of changes with our technology and our, our online things, our websites, and that's not my area. I'm not comfortable with that. But, you know, I can take time out, and I can grow And I'm capable of it if I put in the effort. And so sometimes I think the ways that we want to serve God, you know, we we stick to the areas that are comfortable or natural for us, that correspond with our own skills, with our own interests. But maybe there's a time where we ask ourselves, what could I do to worship Jesus? Maybe there's some needs that we see that are beyond our skill set, but we're capable. We just have to put in the effort. So I think that's a, a good thing for us to entertain as well. She did what she could. It was not easy to procure this very expensive ointment. And again, we'll talk about that in a moment, how difficult that would have been. But it was possible for Mary. And so she did, and she worshiped God in that way. And that's a great example for us. The second thing that I want to draw attention to this morning is the measure of worship. Because different people worshiped Christ in different ways. They served him, or they had conversation with him, or they opened up their home to him. But the measure of Mary's worship was off the chart. It was something that really drew attention to Jesus and just how valuable and special he is in a way that the other methods of worship that night didn't necessarily do because everybody around the table got served by Martha. Everybody got invited to the home. Everybody had conversation with Lazarus around the table, but not everybody got anointed with this oil. It was something that was of extreme measure. In 1849, there was a leader. He was actually the last Maharaja of the Sikh Empire in India. And he gave England's Queen Victoria, at that point in time, one of the most valuable gifts that's ever been given. It was a 186-carat diamond. And Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, he thought that it, it just wasn't quite as shimmery as it should be. It was a little dull, that 186-carat diamond. So he had it cut down to 105 carats. He shaved a lot off, but it really brought out the brilliance of that diamond. And today it's the highlight of the British crown jewels that are in the Tower of London today in London, England. And that diamond is valued at a priceless level. Just for some comparison, the Hope Diamond has actually been appraised. It's in our Smithsonian uh, Museum. It's about 45 carats, so not even half of this size. It's appraised at $350 million. So this gift from the Maharaja of this now 105 carat gem, um, it's truly priceless. And that's kind of almost the level of what Mary does. She takes something that's so beyond uh, means, and that's what she lavishes on Jesus. It says, again in verse 3, just looking back at the facts of what happened, she took an alabaster flask containing a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. And pound, it's it's a Roman pound, and so it's 12 ounces, not our 16-ounce pound that we have today. At Mary's point in time, this 12-ounce flask, let me point this out. This is kind of what the flask would have looked like, just for reference. So it contains about 12 ounces. This was found on the island of Cyprus, so adjacent to Israel in the Mediterranean, but similar period, similar shape. Those kinds of alabaster jars are what we're dealing with here. So 12 ounces of that would have cost 300 days wages, 300 denarius. The denarius was a common laborer's wage. And you think about that. Uh, I guarantee you, you probably don't work 360 days a year, right? You know, if you get off a couple days a week, that's about 308 days a year. And so take your annual salary um, and consider that. And you're dropping your annual salary on a 12-ounce bottle of oil. And that's what Mary did. And we'll see that she did it for a very specific purpose as we go along this morning. Why is it so expensive? Uh, Spikenard, this oil that you're smelling, if you put it on yourself, it's a flowering plant of the honeysuckle family. And it's only grown in the eastern Himalayas of northern India, Nepal, and Bhutan. So what you have on you grows in that area of the globe only between 9,000 and 15,000 feet elevation. And they take the rhizome, the underground root, and they crush it and distill it into this aromatic essential oil. And you can use it for perfume and, and other medicinal purposes as well. You can imagine that getting that from the Himalayas to around Jerusalem and Israel, especially at that time period, was quite an ordeal. Right? For us, we just what we, we Amazon Prime it, and it shows up. But for her, part of the expense was the journey, you know, and procuring that. So it was very rare, very expensive. I had some friends in high school, 
And they set a goal of giving their parents an extravagant gift someday. And it took them several years to save up, but one Christmas they, they gave them a card. And it was just this usual Christmas card. And they opened up the card, and inside the card were tickets for an all-expense-paid Caribbean cruise. And it blew their parents away that these kids would have saved up for years to do that. And they did that because they wanted their parents to know how valuable and how important they were. And that's part of the reason, I think, why Mary gave this gift as well. She wanted Jesus to connect with the fact of how important, how valuable he was to her. And everybody in the room did know that as well because they, they couldn't help but be overwhelmed by the powerful scent of this oil. And so this display it was intended to, to communicate Jesus' value how highly valued Jesus was in her sight. And you know, that's actually a great picture of what worship is. The word worship, we get it from, uh, the etymology of it is worth-ship. So the value or the worth um, that's given to a quality or a position or a person. So when we talk about worshiping God, we're talking about giving God worth, giving God value. And so her expression shows the value that she places on Christ. And our expressions of worship also can show the value that we place or perhaps the value that we don't place on Christ. What are we willing to do to worship him? How are we willing to go about that? Uh, Why does Mary value Jesus so highly? Well, he's been a a respected teacher. He's taught her many things. She even sat at his feet in their home at one point in time and listened to him as he taught the disciples. She also sat at his feet and listened. I mean, the guy, the God-man Christ raised her brother from the dead not too long ago. That's a great way to reason to worship him, right? And she also believed that Jesus was the Messiah, this promised Savior King, God in the flesh, predicted in the Old Testament of the Bible. And so for all those reasons, Jesus was priceless in her eyes. And again, what is Jesus worthy of in our lives? I think that's a valid question. And some of you might say, well, Jesus, he's worthy of my giving, but I'm not so sure about my efforts, you know? I'll give to some organizations or a church or something, but I don't want to do anything. For others, Jesus is worthy of attendance. We're here, right? We're here on Sunday morning or watching here online currently, but maybe we don't want to give him a lot of our attention. For others, he's worthy of our skills, but not our discomfort. And again, the way that that Mary gives transcends discomfort. It's very uncomfortable to sacrifice that expensive of something to worship Christ. It says next that she broke the flask. Now, if you look at the flask, can you go back to that picture one more time? It's got a narrow neck, but if you notice, there's nothing really blocking the top of the bottle. And I would always envision something that was sealed that you would have to break, but that's really not the case. There's an opening at the top, and so you could put a stopper in the top or cover it with a lid of some sort or just keep it open like this. She didn't have to break it. Do you know why she broke it? Because the neck is narrow to restrict the flow. You don't want to use a lot of this at one time, right? You want to save it and savor it and just just control it so none of it gets wasted. And she said, forget the control. I'm breaking the neck off. I just want to pour the whole thing over Jesus' head. And it was her way of saying, Jesus, I'm not holding anything back. You get all of this, all the 300 days wages, all the oil. We don't need to worry about the restrictive neck. We're just going to bust it off so we can pour it out all over you. She didn't want to restrict the flow of her worship. And again, maybe sometimes we're just a little bit restrictive. I want to worship Christ, but I want to kind of control how much, you know. I want to, want to hold it in check. And really that takes us to, to a story in the, in the New Testament that's not a great story. There's a couple named Ananias and Sapphira, and they're the opposite of this, the opposite of Mary. And they decide... A lot of people are giving the early church. uh, There's a lot of needy people there. And so some people are even selling their lands or their homes and things. I mean, big ticket items. And they're giving that to the church and laying it at the apostles' feet. And Ananias and Sapphira, they decide, you know, we're going to sell our piece of land, but we're only going to give a portion of it. And that wasn't a problem. They could have decided to give a portion. But they decided, we're going to lie. We're going to say, here's it all. Here's all of it. We'll put it all at your feet. But that's only a small portion of it. And so they lied, and because of that, the Holy Spirit actually required their life for that. So it was a major thing. But the point of it is, is, you know, worship isn't something that's intended to be restricted. I mean, and if you do restrict it, at least don't lie about it, you know, but don't pretend to be one thing. But Mary's heart was in a totally opposite place. Uh, she, She wanted to give wholeheartedly to God of everything that she could in every way that she could. 
And what she does, it honors Jesus. It elevates him above everyone else because immediately, again, this hugely expensive oil, it's on him. And you, you can't avoid that. You can't get away from that. And so attention is immediately drawn to him because of the smell that overpowers the room. You know, it's coming from him. It's emanating from him now. It's in his hair. By the way, with perfume, uh, if you want something to last and to stick around, the hair is probably the best place that you can put it because the fibers hold it in and it doesn't evaporate as quickly. And so um, this would have been something that was retained for quite some period of time um, because it was poured on his head. But it honors Christ. Nobody else gets the oil on their head and their feet. Jesus does. Also, nobody else gets her glory. Uh, I read this article, it was uh, written by Dr. Eli Lazorkin Eisenberg, and he works with the Israeli Institute of Biblical Studies. And he said, in Judaism and many other cultures in the ancient world, a woman's hair was associated with her glory, her self-worth, and her respect. Not only did Mary pour an extremely expensive ointment on Jesus' feet, she also used her hair to wipe the oil that didn't get absorbed into Jesus' skin. In other words, she put her self-worth at his feet, she gave him her riches and her glory. So she humbled herself by bowing down, putting his hair or her hair on his feet. But also, she took the most glorious thing she had and she rubbed someone's feet with it. Think about you. What's the most precious possession that you have, the most treasured thing about you? Would you take that and rub it on someone's feet? You know, it was like the ultimate act of, of worship saying, Here's my most glorious thing. It's what I have, the best thing I have. Here's the oil, here's my hair. And it's all at your feet. My respect is at your feet. My glory is at your feet. Um, it was extravagant worship that first Easter. It says the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil, and so it permeated the house. And again, it's something that you can't possibly imagine just from a small bit of that oil that's perhaps on your skin now. And I want to argue as well, that's something that didn't go away. And we think about different dimensions of the crucifixion and the resurrection, right? And we see the visuals, maybe we imagine things in our mind, but we don't, we don't have a scent connected with it. And I really think from this point on, when Jesus was arrested, uh, when Jesus really um, was at the Last Supper a few days later, when Jesus was arrested in the garden, when he came before the religious leaders on trial, when he stood before Pilate, when he was nailed to the cross by the guards, all those people couldn't have helped but smell this very extravagant, very expensive oil. And they knew, like, this is not normal, this is not ordinary, and this is overpowering. And I think perhaps, uh, I can't prove it, but perhaps even when Jesus resurrected, I don't know if the oil made it through that process or not, but at least up until that point in time, it was uh, like, you could not help but notice that. It's something that followed him through all these things that we read about in Scripture. And Jesus finally highlights the significance of that. In Mark 14, 9, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, uh, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And so if we want to accomplish something that's significant in Jesus' eyes, perhaps one way to do that is to make a significant personal sacrifice like Mary did. And that really brings us to the last thing that we'll discuss as we close this morning. And, and that's the motive, the motive behind all of this. Motives are really tricky because you can't see my heart and I can't see your heart. And you can't see my mind and I can't see your mind. I had an experience last night and it reminded me of something that happened in the past. I was in a parking lot at a grocery store locally and I looked over and I saw someone who had purchased a brand new 2020 Corvette, mid-engine Corvette, the new model. And they had a, a nice little uh, dusting brush and they were just polishing it, walking around their vehicle, going over it. You know what my first thought was? My first thought was a little judgmental. I thought, man, you know, like this has, become, this has become it in their life. But I was reminded, I don't know their motive. Let me tell you about a friend of mine that I knew a few years ago. He also owned a Corvette, and it was a nice one. But you know why he owned the Corvette? He and his wife, they had a ministry. They were a part of a Corvette club, and they sought to reach people that were in the Corvette club for Jesus. And initially, you may look at that and think, well, that's an extravagant waste. You know, how can you justify that? But if God's leading you to do that and to reach those people, what a great avenue. And he also had a business of restoring old Corvettes. He could take a, uh, something out of the 50s, like a 50s Corvette, out of a junkyard and make it look pristine after a few months. And so that was part of his business as well, and he would get clientele through the, the club. And so it was a tied, to, tied to his livelihood, but also tied to his way of ministering to people. And he was kind of uniquely equipped to do that, right? 
And so we can't judge people. We can't judge motives. But Jesus' disciples and Judas certainly do here. In verse 4, it says, when some of his disciples saw it, they were indignant. That means they, they were angry, right? They were ticked off. How could she waste all this? Mary's worship, it doesn't make any sense to them. And maybe God calls us to worship him in ways that really don't make sense to people. And maybe we look at other people's worship sometimes and we think, like, why would you do that? How can you consider that worship? But we're not God. It's really hard to see motives. So we have to be careful about that. It says, one of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray Jesus later, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii, 300 days wages, and given to the poor? And then it says, they, so Judas and a few other of Jesus' disciples, criticized her sharply. They literally scolded Mary. They look at her and they say, how could you have wasted this, pouring this out on Jesus' hair, rubbing his feet with this? Do you know how much money that was worth? And they do this right in front of Jesus. But they're, yeah, Judas does this right in front of Jesus and right in front of Mary. They're coming down hard on her. The proceeds, they would have totaled a year's wages. The poor in Bethany could have been sustained, cared for, for who knows how long. And they're very critical. And another note here culturally, Bethany is a unique location for this comment to be made. Um, Bethany is a Latin word. It came into our English translation that way. But it's derived from a Hebrew term, Beth Ani, or Aramaic, Beth Anya. Both of those terms mean house of the poor or house of the afflicted. And so it's very possible, based on some ancient documents that were discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Temple Scroll from Qumran Caves, that Bethany is actually one of a few places that was designated to keep the poor and the sick. And the Jews, they didn't want anything considered unclean too close to their temple in Jerusalem. And so it had to be a specific distance away, a mile away at least from the temple and from the the entrance to the city. Bethany, again, was 1.75 miles away. So it was just far enough not to get their temple unclean with all of these sick and poor people, so to speak. But perhaps this town, because of its name, was really focused to, on and dedicated to the poor people and serving the poor, which would make this statement all the more relevant. Look around us. There's all these poor people to care for and these sick people. How could you have wasted so much money pouring it out on Jesus? You broke the jar. Couldn't you have at least put the stopper in, just given him a little bit? But you broke the jar. And we don't know what Judas' motive is. At first, I mean, his argument, it sounds very convincing, doesn't it? What a waste. You bought the Corvette to minister to the Corvette club, didn't you? Yeah, what a waste. Sounds so convincing. But then John, looking back, he reveals some of Judas' motive because he sees over time. He didn't know at the time, but all this comes out. John says, this he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box for their ministry, and he used, it to, or he used to take what was put into it. So he used to sift out of the, the ministry box for Jesus and the disciples and pocket some of it. And they didn't realize it at the time. Jesus knew, but no one else knew that at the time. So his selfish desires are actually gar- guiding his heart and his response. And maybe when it comes to the ways that we choose to worship God, uh, our selfish desires actually guide our heart and how we respond. I'll do this for the Lord, but I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't do that. I don't want to do that. And that's kind of Judas coming out, isn't it? Verse 7, but Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? And so right away, Jesus stands up for Mary. He can see how much this comment has wounded her when they, they scold her for this, just like you would feel if someone scolded you. And so Jesus stands up and gets in the way, and he says, leave her alone. Don't trouble her. She has done a good work for me. She has kept this for the day of my burial. And so you see it as a waste, but she's been directing all these savings, all this money she's been putting away, and even the purchase of this item. Maybe you knew that she had this item, and you wondered, why did Mary spend money on that? Jesus says, she's kept this for the day of my burial. She's been working toward it, intending to use this all along. That's been her purpose, uh, saving up for it, acquiring it. And she did it because she knows I'm going to die. Jesus had told his disciples, I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. But nobody really believed him. Mary did. And she knew that. And she was working toward that. So her effort had been going toward this good purpose that she she knew would happen at some point in time. And Jesus is affirming everything that she's been putting her time and her efforts and her money into. And again, that brings us to the question of why. 
What is the why? Why are we worshiping? She had a purpose. I want to prepare Jesus for this burial. He's going to die for the sins of the world, and I want to anoint his body with that. Jesus says, for you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good, but me you don't have always. And so, yes, the poor are going to be a permanent priority, especially in Bethany, the house of the poor, the house of the afflicted, right? Here, they're always going to be a priority. There's always going to be an opportunity to show charity to these poor people and to give to them. Whenever you wish, Jesus says, you can do them good. I mean, whenever you desire, there's people right outside the door. You can help them. But her window with Jesus, it's something that's passing because Jesus is going to die, be resurrected, and ascend back to the Father in heaven. And so her time is limited to do this. We don't know how much time we have to worship the Lord. We don't have all the time in the world. We don't know when he'll return. We don't know when our lives will end and we'll find ourselves in his presence. And so we have to seize the opportunity now, as Mary did. Um, here are some action steps. And the action steps aren't things to do. They're more questions that you might ask yourself. Uh, these are in the bulletins. If you want to take one of those with you, there's notes that are in the bulletin as well today. Um, here's some things to consider, things for me to consider. One, what was the significance of the first Easter? We talked about how that linked back to Passover and why Jesus died for our sins, why he rose again, and what the significance of that was toward the beginning. Secondly, uh, how am I currently worshiping Jesus? Or am I? Uh, thirdly, what personal sacrifice could I make to communicate just how valuable Jesus is to me? Yeah, you know, I could, I could probably, you know, do this, but if I did this, it would really be a sacrifice. And so, like, it would show people Jesus is really valuable, just like Mary did. Fourth, how am I misjudging the worship of other people? Maybe we have ideas or we've labeled certain people as, you know, fanatical or irresponsible because of the ways they worship. How do we view that? How are we judging people wrongly? How is my own selfishness restricting my worship? What good purpose could I direct my efforts toward here in my church or in my community? Again, Mary had this, this specific purpose of acquiring this very, very costly oil so she could eventually use it for Jesus' burial. And then seven, what is one thing I could do to directly care for the poor in my community? There's opportunities around us just as there were in Bethany. And so all those things might be things that we reflect on this Easter. But this Easter, let's make it an extravagant one and really consider how we might serve God, worship God in a greater way. Let's go ahead and pray today.